Good to see you. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're in the midst of our study in <clears throat> a number of the Psalms. And uh, we're not going through every single one of them, but we're highlighting a few of them. And uh, we have, uh, last week we started uh, a study from Psalm chapter 73. And those of you who have the notes, and by the way, online you can still click the link and download them, I believe. And uh, we're on page two of your notes. So if, you want to, if you're not sure what page two is, just look in the bottom right where it says two. And uh, I just, after that whole QR code thing from Sunday, <laughs> man, that was, um, that was funny is what it was. It was just, wow, it was incredible. I may do something like that again just if I need a laugh. But uh, we're looking at Psalm chapter 73, and we have a, um, uh, the, the, the psalmist is talking about uh, dealing with some questions in his faith and some doubts that he was experiencing. He was at a, at a time where he found himself kind of asking the question, why? What, God, why do you handle things this way? Why do you do things this way? Why, why is this going on? Specifically, this psalmist was talking about how he did not understand <clears throat> how the wicked people, the sinful people, the people that did not worship God or honor God, seemed to be so blessed, while the people like him who were devoted to the Lord didn't seem to be getting the blessings, or they didn't seem to be as prosperous or prospering like people who weren't even worshiping the Lord. And so this, uh, the, the, the person who wrote this psalm is kind of going back and forth. It's like, man, I just don't understand this. And he's at this point where he has some questions. And uh, before I, I, I dig into where we left off, I want to make this statement again. <clears throat> Getting answers to your sincere questions, I think that's huge. It's central in growing your faith. Uh, some of us may have grown up in a type of faith system where if you dared question anything, you know, you were considered backslidden or a sinner or, you know, how dare you have any questions? Just, just have faith. And, 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 you know, th there's merit to having faith when we don't understand God. But at the same time, I think sometimes we, we keep some of these moments suppressed in our relationship with God, and when we don't understand God, why do you do things, you know, or why do you allow some things to take place that I don't understand? Why is this going on when it makes perfect sense to me that it should be different? And if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us have had those moments where we've said, okay, God, I don't get this. And let me free you, let me liberate anybody watching or listening here today let me liberate you from feeling guilty for having those questions because the best of the best in the scriptures had questions and they had doubts and they had things that they did not understand. Now, I don't think God wants us to live in a uh, total stage of doubt and confusion and anger. I don't think that's God's plan at all. But uh, on, the, on the other side, I think that there's some things that we can do in a healthy way to deal with our frustrations and our questions and our doubts. And so we see the psalmist who's talking about his frustrations and he's just gut level honest with God and what he's saying. And uh, this picks up to the, to the bottom of page two. And we are, I want to make sure I get to the right slide, where it says the role of reason, the role of reason. Uh, in Psalm 73, looking at verse 16, he says, When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. <laughs> uh, sometimes just trying to figure things out, common sense-wise, will seem a little troubling, right? Right? Uh, because I have learned that God does not always act 
like we want him to act. Or maybe even better, God doesn't always <clears throat> do things the way that we would do them. And uh, I, I have just this week, I have uh, dealt with uh, some people that are fairly close to me who lost spouses. Um, and there's these questions, you know, why? Why would this take place? Why, why is this happening? One lady was in her 40s, one lady's uh, uh, a day older than I am, my cousin. And so there, there's a lot, of, a lot of questions, a lot of, uh, you know, why, 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 why? And then we try to intellectualize God. And he, here's something that I want to, I'm going I'm to speak to two sides of this coin, okay? One side is this, that I have to try to figure God out. And for some people, that will forever be a holdup in, in really getting to know God. That'll forever be a, a, an obstacle in, in knowing Jesus. Because, because we have this, I've got this, uh, I got this fill box, okay? And within this fill box, P-H-I-L, Within this fill box, I've got my intellect, I've got my reasoning, I've got my rationale. I've got everything that I understand, I've got the way that I'm wired, I've got all this. And so what happens sometimes, if I'm not careful, I think God fits into my box. So God should think like me, because I'm a pretty good person. I love God, I love people, I love my family, I love this and that and everything. So God should somehow fit in my box, and He doesn't. And what I find out is that God is so way beyond my box. Way beyond my box. He's way beyond my rationale. And he's way beyond my intellect. And he's way beyond my understanding. And, and to some that sounds like a cop-out, and it's not. We, we can never try to intellectualize God. We can never try to put human reasoning and rationale onto a supernatural God. We just can't. It doesn't work that way. Now, on the flip side, being a Christian does not mean you check your brain in at the door. Being a Christian does not believe that you are a total doofus when it comes to your intellect. And I don't care, what, and, and of course, what happens, okay? If there's some situation, and there's a bunch of Christians on the street, what's CNN going to do? They're not going to say, hey, find the strongest Christian that you can find. And let's get them on TV. You know, what are they going to do? Let's find the weirdest dude we can possibly find. You know, the one that still lives in his mother's basement and makes YouTube videos? Let's go to him. And, and that's, that's not us. That's not us. There is a role in the brain that God has given us. God has given each of us a brain. He expects us to use them. Okay. <laughs> no, I won't say that. Uh, he, he expects us to use them. And I think we need to learn to think clearly and deeply about some difficult issues. One thing about me, I'm a thinker. I probably overanalyze things a lot. I thought that I was the most analytical person on earth. <laughs> Till my son came into this world. <laughs> that guy will analyze the, the atoms out of, a, out of a cell. It is incredible. And, and, uh, and so being wired that way, uh, our intellect is good. It's good for us to analyze and think about stuff, but we, we can't allow it to go so far that we doubt God. So there has to be a fine line, a fine balance that we have there with our intellect, with our reasoning, with our rationale, what we think about certain situations. But there is a strong likelihood that the questions that I am asking have been asked before. Remember what I've said about isolation, how the enemy loves to isolate us? You're the only one thinking this way. You're the only one going through this. You're the only one that's made this mistake. You're the only one that's been tempted this way. And a constant weapon or device of the enemy is to try to isolate us 
in order to think that we're the only ones that act this way or feel this way or are thinking this way or have been through this. And it's just not true. Again, some of the best of the best. I'll give you an example. I don't have it on the screen. But when Jesus was baptized in water, John the Baptist, who did the baptizing, he, he, he stands in front of all these people and he says, Behold the Lamb. He points to Jesus, says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay? Then after John the Baptist is in prison, he sends his disciples a message to Jesus. Are you the one? Wow. And Jesus himself said, there will, you will not find a greater human being than John the Baptist. So if that guy with a, no, with a Jesus endorsement as being the best of the best will have his doubts and have his moments of questioning, we are allowed as well. Because here's the good news. Jesus didn't strike down lightning on John the Baptist and pfft, you're fried. He, he didn't do that at all. He didn't do that at all. And he won't with us. Stan, sorry. I like to think like Solomon said. There's nothing new under the sun. Uh, that is so true. Ecclesiastes, uh, he says that. There's nothing new under the sun. There really isn't. There really isn't. My doubts, my thoughts, the things that I wonder, others have been there. Uh, not just Bible characters, by the way. Spiritual, that spiritual giant that you see, they have their questions. They have their doubts. That grandma that prays for you all the time, they've had their doubts. They've had their questions. We don't like to admit it. This pastor has had his questions. This pastor has had his issues. <laughs> I still have issues. But the Lord is okay with my issues. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, you're the only person that's ever been through this, so. No, that, that is legit. That, that is a very real, because we're not, we don't want to give up. We're not going to give up on God. We're not going to turn our backs on him. But then there's this like, okay, you know, I know what your word says. So why is this not happening? And, uh, and that's really where this kind of comes into play, because Mary Lou is absolutely right. It's not really a matter of doubting God. It's just not understanding. Not understanding. And I, I, I want to show us how the author of this psalm came to deal with that, uh, because it's, it's a legitimate hurdle that we have to be we have to allow ourselves to try to jump over, and sometimes we trip over. <laughs> uh, look at this before I move on, because the answer is coming here. When we find ourselves at the limits of our reason, we need to realize that it's okay to be like Paul, greatest missionary of all time, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, wrote much of the New Testament. And he said this, we are hard-pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We are perplexed but we're not in despair. So Paul was, dis Paul was perplexed. Okay, so ask yourself, all right? When Paul was stoned, when, when, when the religious leaders threw rocks at him to kill him and they left him for dead, I doubt he got up and said, praise God. That was wonderful. Let's get some back teen and let's pick this thing up where I left off. I'm, I'm sure you got to wonder, there are some questions here. Shipwrecked, whipped, beat up, imprisoned multiple times, 
angry mobs, all this. So when Paul says that there were moments that he was perplexed, yeah, I would be too. And I bet you would too. The question is, what do we do with that? And this is where the author of this psalm begins to make a bit of a transformation. Okay? And I will tell you that I don't think it's a quick one. Like with Mary Lou's question, you can be praying for years and years and years and years for some things. But there's a lot of things that still have to fall into place. Those of us with unsaved loved ones, for example, okay? We pray that God would save their soul. We pray that they would get saved, but we also know that God won't force himself on anybody. We also know that sometimes they have to have a, an Apostle Paul experience before they give their lives over to Jesus. So a lot of times there's this loaded uh, bunch of stuff that has to take place in order for God's will to be accomplished and for our answers to be, or I'm sorry, for our prayers to be answered. But the author of the psalm finds out that his worship transformed things. Didn't necessarily transform the situation, but it transformed him. Worship not, will not always transform your situation. Our prayers, see, see, knowing Mary Lou, okay, and how much she loves the Lord and other people. As, as you have worshiped the Lord and you have prayed, okay, whether or not the situation got transformed, there's a transforming work that takes place in you that was enough to say, I'm still going to hold on to God here. I'm, still, I'm not going to give up on him. And, and in verse 17, the author of the psalm, he begins to experience this transformation. Verse 17 says, Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. Now again, specifically, the psalmist is saying, I don't get why wicked people are blessed and, and righteous people are not. And it really upset him. And it didn't click for him, that, that situation did not click for him until he went to the temple, into the sanctuary, and began to worship. And that's where things began to come alive. I'm on page three, by the way, towards the top. See, worship... Worship. I'm so glad we're not so much in the music wars anymore like we were in the 80s. Okay, and, and yeah, poor Jonathan and Jessica, they're like the 80s. Wow. I mean, how old? But there was, a, there was this battle. There was this battle, right, over worship style. And, 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 and uh, I think at least this church doesn't freak out on that stuff. But uh, worship is not just singing four songs or however many Jonathan Jesus is saying. Worship's not just reciting a bunch of words, whether we know it or not, off a screen. Here's one thing worship does. Worship helps us understand our reality better because it considers how all things find their proper place in relationship to who God is. See, Somebody, somebody comes up to me and says, well, I, I didn't really like that song. I said, well, we weren't singing to you. <laughs> right? We weren't singing to you. And, 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 and they don't like that answer, but it's true. So the purpose of my worship, you see, is to express who God is. And when I do that, then there's this incredible moment. There's this transformation that God either begins or does right away, where some of this stuff begins to fall into place where it rightly needs to be compared to the greatness of God. See, because here's the deal. My stresses and my situations and my crises and my difficulties can really get exaggerated 
in my fill box. Okay? My rationale, my intellect, my, the way I'm wired, okay? You know, there's a problem in my family, the people that I love. You know, beat up on me all, all you want, but don't, you know, don't touch my loved ones, for example. Or, or, you know, this situation, financial situation, health situation. Just like, oh, that's taking up a lot of room in my fill box. But then when I worship God, I got to get out of my fill box. And then I see how great he is. That's what worship does. Worship magnifies my view of him. And then it actually minimizes my view of my questions, my confusions. Doesn't mean they go away, okay? Doesn't mean they always go away. But, but, now my perspective has changed a little bit. Maybe a lot. Because I'm out of my fill box and I'm in the presence of God. And when I'm in the presence of God, I see this awesome, incredible, wonderful Lord of my, of my life and the Savior of my soul. And I see this and it's just like, you know what? You know, who, who cares what that person said about me? And, and, and oh, oh, okay, yeah, I, I don't feel well. But boy, he's, he's still great. And I still feel cruddy, but, but he's still great. And because he's so great, I bet he can take care of that. And that's this transformation that takes place for me when I worship. Because what's happening, I am coming to grips with who God is. Because I've, I tend to spend an inordinate amount of time come to grips with things that are actually a little bit exaggerated in my life if I am not careful. Not to minimize them, but they're not bigger than God. And so the psalmist, in the midst of his confusion, and, and really, it seems anger, he comes into the sanctuary, into the presence of God, and he worships. And, and that brings on this new way of seeing some things. And this is what worship does. Worship will change our perspective on the things that we're... Fa- that's, why, that's why, okay? If you're going through something, that is not the time to stray from being in the house of the Lord. If you're going through some difficulty, that is not the time to distance yourself from God. If you're going through something, that is not the time to isolate yourself from the rest of the body of Christ. In fact, that is the moment that you really, really, really need those things. So worship changes our perspective. It gives us a new way of seeing a few things. And we have those listed kind of in the middle of page three. First of all, we see the end of the wicked. These these people that the author of this psalm was kind of getting jealous of, if we're not too brutally honest, or he was at least disturbed by, it dawned on him, now wait a minute. Here I am in the presence of God, and I'm wondering why the wicked people are prospering and, and the righteous people are not. But then he says this, surely you will place them on a slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors? They're like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as, <laughs> as fantasies. See, here's the deal. The author of the psalm came to grips with the fact that these people that I'm so disturbed by, actually their end is way worse than mine. And this isn't just on a spiritual sense either. You know, it's, (laughs) uh, uh, I've I've golfed in some pretty cool locations uh, and, and being as bad of a golfer as I am, I cannot believe that I get those opportunities. But, but I remember I was in uh, Sawgrass, Stan, and, and, and it's the, the, the Players' Championship course in, in uh, Ponte Vedra, whatever that is, Florida, okay? Beautiful, beautiful. And we're, we're on the course, and, you know, I'm looking for my ball, and, uh, and, and, we're, and I'm seeing all these houses. I mean... Okay, right? Like their bathroom is worth more than my home, okay? You, you know what I'm saying, right? 
It's like, wow. And, and, but it was interesting because the caddy, we had a caddy with our foursome, and the caddy said, yeah, but you'd be amazed just how unhappy these people are. He said, they might have some really nice stuff, but they are miserable people. They are miserable people. But isn't it interesting? It's like, man, I wish I had that. I wish I was blessed like that. But really, where is our treasure? Our worth? Our happiness? It's really not found in stuff. Stuff is good, okay? But, but that's not where we find our joy. That's not where we find our, our contentment. Not at all. And the psalmist said, yeah, you know what? They're blessed, but boy, if they, if they don't change, their ending is way worse than mine. Worship will see that there's a difference and there's a different blessing that awaits those that live for God and those that choose not to. Uh, secondly, worship gives us a new way of seeing the effect of envy. This, this was several years ago. I've been here 20 years, so there's no way you're going to know who I'm talking about. But uh, we, we, one time we had a, a family that had started attending, and I asked a friend of mine, hey, you know, what do you think of them? I don't like them. Why don't you like them? I don't know. They got a lot of money. I said, well, okay, I'm glad your standards are so high. <laughs> I, I don't like them, and, and, but isn't it fun? Come on, ladies. I, rem- I remember working in an office one time, and, and, and we had a, uh, the church, and we had a Christian school, and the new Christian school secretary walked in, okay? Fairly attractive Italian lady, okay? Whatever, but I wasn't the one that was talking about the attractive lady, it was all the other ladies in the office. Oh, look at her. Mm-hmm. You know, just judging because she was prettier than they were. <laughs> but this is what envy does. It, it will cause us to, uh, to, to have some very misguided ideas of people, and that will really mess us up spiritually. Uh, in, in verses 21 and 22, again, I'm always with you. The psalmist says, you hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you will take me in to glory. So the author of the psalm recognizes what's really important. It wasn't the material blessings of the people that he was so irritated with. It was what he had with his Lord. That's what mattered. Uh, Maybe it's an age thing, but... I don't really get caught up in a lot of stuff anymore. I just don't. Not at all. It was, <laughs> I think my wife's watching, but we, we, we went on this vacation in Cancun, okay? It was awesome. Probably one of these once-in-a-lifetime things. This was our third attempt at getting a vacation because the first two attempts got canceled because of COVID. So you used to say you're going to save some money. So we go down there. Somehow, some way, I'll, I'll try to make this very long story short. Somehow, some way, okay, somebody told the management at the resort that Annette and I were VIPs. <laughs> okay, now you got to understand, Annette and I, that's just not how we're wired, okay? Not at all. Not at all. You know, I always joke around that, you know, I'm the white trash guy walking around there, you know, where's the pool? You know, it just, that's me. And so, but, you know, every, like, every meal, the chef is coming to introduce himself to us. I'm thinking, hey, <laughs> you know, it's just the weirdest thing. And, and I thought, ah, oh, man, this is, this this just isn't who I am, you know, and, and, and if, if you love that, you eat that up, great, but, but, but for me, I was like, oh, you know what, I'm just a regular guy, and I just love God, and I love my family, and I love my church, and that's really all I need, and uh, now, I mean, 
having a good meal didn't hurt either. But, but I'm just saying. But do you hear what I'm saying? It's just like, I, I've just, I wasn't like, mm, oh, how dare you put the towel there? It should be over there. You know, just, that's not me. That's not me. I'm pretty content with the fact that God loves me and I love him. And I have been blessed with an amazing, amazing, wonderful family. And, uh, and a wonderful church. That's really all I need. Worship will also cause you to come to grips or it'll give you a different way of seeing the goodness of God. That's on the bottom of page three. <laughs> it had to be. It had to be. I, I just think God was laughing the entire time at me because I'm like, oh, okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, more stories I could tell, but I won't. The goodness of God. Worship causes us to see truly the goodness of God. And starting in verse uh, 23, it says, Yet I'm always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. Afterwards, you take me into glory. Uh, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you, but as for me, it's good to be near God. Did you catch that? As for me, it's good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of your deeds. I love that. In the middle of that last paragraph, I underlined for me the overwhelming goodness and joy and purpose and fulfillment God has for us is not something that can be enjoyed apart from Him because it flows from Him. You want contentment? You can't have that apart from God because that flows from God. You want joy and happiness? You can't have that apart from God because all of that flows from God. You can't take him out of the picture of the very things that he provides in the first place. That's where our contentment comes. That's where our happiness comes. That's the goodness of God. So I'm, I'm going to close out here. I'm on the last page of your notes. And the last few verses, we're told that God is near to us. As for me, it's good to be near God. And what does that mean? Um, first of all, it means that God holds us close. He holds us. God never lets us go. God does not let you go. God has a firm grip on you. And I will also say that some try to run from God, but that is a difficult thing to do at times. It's not as easy as you would think. I know people that have served God, been used up by God. They've tried to walk away from God. That walk is not an easy journey. That walk is difficult. That journey is tough. And rightfully so. Because when you've tasted the gift of God, to try to willfully walk away from that should make you miserable. In fact, my prayer <laughs> for anybody who deliberately walks away from God, Lord, make them miserable. Every, every drug, every drink, every decision, every God may just make them sick until they finally come to their senses and come to know God again. So God's near us, and so He holds us. Secondly, He guides us. God counsels us. He leads us. He instructs us. He guides us. That's another reason why it's good to be near God. It's easier to get direction from somebody when you're physically close to them in order to hear them. 
it gets difficult when you're far from that person who's supposed to be leading you, and then there's other voices and noises that are competing. If I want to get some direction from Keith, way in the back over there, I doubt I'm going to get... Don't yell at me, Keith. Okay. Uh, don't whisper at me, Keith. Uh, if I'm all the way here, I may not even hear what he has to say, especially if y'all are talking. But the closer I get to Keith, the more clearly I'll hear him. The more clearly I'll understand what he has to say to me. The closer we get to God, the more near to God we are, the easier it is to discern his voice and to figure out what it is he's trying to say and lead us and guide us. And I'm going to tell you this. When you need that, your biggest decisions, uh, I'm repeating myself on purpose, is not between good and bad, but good and best. And that's when that, those choices of good and best, those are your two options, you need to be near God and hear what he has to say and hear his leading and feel his presence in your spirit. And then when God is near us, he, um, he receives us. It means staying close to God, that he accepts us. Maybe when nobody else does, God accepts us. When we've been rejected by others, God still receives us. He takes us just as we are, and he loves us too much to leave us that way. He takes us in. He receives us, and he will not let go. We don't have to utter a password. <laughs> we don't have to measure up to anything or anybody. We don't clean up the car before we go to the car wash. We take ourselves to God, and he receives us, and he does his work in us. I'm going to close with this psalm, verses 26 and 27 and 28. And I've underlined the parts that I want you to really take home with you today. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart. And he's my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish and you will destroy all that are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. And I will tell of your deeds. This questioning man of God who wrote this psalm said, in spite of it all, I'll stay near to God. I may not even get all the answers. God, you may not even change my situation, but Lord, change me. You, you may not, you will do with my, my life what you will. My situation, my crisis, my difficulty, my need, my hope. Do with that what you will. But it's good to be near you, God. So even if things work out in such a way that I don't quite understand, I pray little by little as I worship you that I will come to grips with who you really are and what my situation really is. So it's okay to question, but let's bring our questions into the presence of God. And if he doesn't change those situations, maybe he can at least do a work in us personally to be able to deal with it. Amen? So let's pray. God, I love your word. Thank you for speaking to us today, and I really believe you have. Thank you for your presence. I'm asking you now, Lord, that you would uh, go before us as we uh, continue with our week, keep us safe as we travel, uh, guide us as we try to serve you. And Lord, I'll thank you for what you do. And God, I pray that you meet us right where we're at with any questions we have, misunderstandings. God, may, may we never allow it to shipwreck our faith, but rather, Lord God, may we stay near to you. May we get even closer to you. And Lord, I'll thank you in Jesus' name. And we all said amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Online crowd, thank you so much for being here tonight. We love you all. Bowling is this Friday. Woo! God bless. We'll see you later.